right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time of worship that you have given us together as the church family. We thank you for your spirit being here with us. I pray, uh, we pray that you would just continue having your presence known, that you would give us wisdom, you would give us understanding as we get into your word, and not only wisdom and understanding, but courage and boldness, Lord, to share these things with a world that desperately needs it. So thank you for that, Lord, and we want to praise you in advance for all that you're going to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, welcome. Glad you guys are here. I want to remind those of you that are here that are disciples of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's two things to you. He's your Lord and he is your Savior. I want to remind you to win your friends, win your family, and win your neighbors for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you are just visiting us or maybe you're tuning in online trying to check out this whole Christian thing and find out what it's about, we're glad you're here. I want you to know something very important. God accepts you just as you are. In other words, you don't have to fix yourself to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and Jesus fixes you. And if you are here and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with me? Um, I just heard that Christian life was just fun and I wanted to try it out. Um, Sorry, but something's wrong with you. (laughs) It's the same thing that's wrong with me and wrong if, with every one of us. We have fallen short of God's glory. That is the truth. We're going to find out about the truth today, but we're also going to find out about grace. And so hopefully you enjoy your time with us. You may have seen one of these before, called it a Bible. For those of us that are God's disciples, we know this is the inerrant and the infallible word of the one true living God. All those two words mean is that everything that is in here is right, it is perfect, it is unchanging. You can bet your life on this, and it will always work, I promise you. So because of that, we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 today, and the title of the message is Fully Relying on God. Frog Life is, is the series, so Fully Relying on God for a Good Reputation. And this series, Frog Life. So we ended 1 Thessalonians with the understanding of our need as believers to fully rely on God. We're taking that thought that Paul finished the first letter with, and we're letting that carry us through the second letter. And we're going to go through verse by verse through 2 Thessalonians and go through each verse with that thought of us fully relying on God. Last week when we were together, we talked about relying on Him when times get tough. And let's face it, we all go through tough times. How many of you went through a tough time this week? Okay, so see what I'm talking about. This is, this is just life. Um, we're not going through the tribulation. Uh, you might think so. Maybe your, your situation is that difficult where you think you're going through the tribulation. Trust me, you are not. Uh, the tribulation is going to be so horrible. It's going to be a time on earth that this world has never seen. And so we go through tough times And God uses those tough times to strengthen us, to grow us in character, and grow us in our reliance on Him. Um, Last week, we talked about the the idea of relying on Him in those tough times because He can increase our faith. We walk by by faith, and it's the faith that we have is the very faith He's given us. So He increases that. He can love through us, even those people that are unlovable. And we all have those kind of people in our lives. It's just difficult to love, but God's brought them in our path for a reason. And we talked about the idea that sometimes these tough times can go on for a long time. And we truly need to rely on Him. But, but the beautiful thing about it is this life here on earth is just a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. When we count our life here against eternity, it really isn't that long at all. And the older I get, the more I have found that to be true, that life is very, very short. Uh, But if you did miss last week, you can go to 412marietta.com forward slash sermons and you can catch up with us. But today I want to talk to you about fully relying on God for a good reputation. A good reputation. Proverbs 22 tells us that a good reputation is something that you and I as believers should be chasing after. We should choose this. Every day when we wake up, we should choose to have a good reputation over great riches. We all want great riches. If you are a human being, you work and you look for the best job to give you the best money so you can do well in life. That's just a given. We all 
are, we all understand this. But God says, listen, as you're going after those riches, what's more important than the riches is a good reputation. Being held in high esteem is better than silver or gold. Now, let me just make sure that I explain something so that way we know how to move forward in this message. Let me tell you what a good re- reputation is not. A good reputation is not that you are popular. Okay? Good, you know, people think, well, I've got a good reputation. I'm really popular. Now, listen, there's a lot of people that are very popular for very bad things. They don't have a good reputation. They're just popular. Uh, so we, we shouldn't think about our reputation and our popularity as being synonymous. They're not. Um, a good reputation is not that you are liked by everybody. Um, I can tell you this unequivocally. I have a good reputation in certain areas of my life. I'm not perfect, but I have a good reputation in certain areas of my life. I, I think probably the, the strongest area is my relationship with my family, my wife and my children. I have a great wife. I have good kids. Um, I love my wife incredibly, and she loves me, and we've got a really good marriage, and that's a good area in my life. Now, we've got that because I generally have fulfilled my role as a husband, generally. I'm not, again, I'm not perfect, so I'm not sitting here trying to pat myself on the back. I just want to explain a, a concept to you. I've generally done what a husband's supposed to do biblically. Now, my wife has generally done what a wife is supposed to do biblically. And what that is, is I'm supposed to love my wife, I'm supposed to protect my wife, I'm supposed to provide for my wife, I'm supposed to do those things. Now, she's supposed to respect me. She's supposed to submit to me. That's the job of the wife in the marriage, the job of the husband is to love the wife. Now, that's not popular, okay? It's not. So I do have a good reputation in the sense that I am a good husband. Now, if you go into the world and say, okay, now, what do you think of Tim? (laughs) <laughs> they're not going to like the reputation that I have, even though it's a good reputation. They're not gonna like, I'm not going to be very popular. Why? Because I will be seen as misogynistic. My wife will be seen as, as a woman who's just sold out and won't fight the power for women because she submits to, to a, a man. Uh, so we don't, we're not necessarily popular in some certain circles. Now, amongst Christian people that want godly marriages, we would be popular. But again, you know, when you look at the world, the world would go, well, no, why would we want that? We don't want that. You know, what, God forbid a, a woman submit to a man, you know. Um, does that make sense? That, that it's, not, it's not about being popular. You, you may have a good reputation, and there will be people that don't like you. And that's just how it's going to be. I think it's kind of cool that you would have a good reputation and have people not like you. Because Jesus had a pretty good reputation, didn't he? And yet there were a lot of people that did not like him. In fact, they wanted to kill him and, in fact, killed him. So um, that's just how it goes. The most loved, the most liked person to have ever walked this planet was Jesus. And the most hated person, the most disliked person to have ever walked this planet is Jesus. And so you can have a good reputation and still not be liked by everybody. So As we move forward, just understand this, that it's not about being popular. It's not about being liked. In fact, those things really shouldn't be on your radar. When you're looking at the type of of, um, reputation it is that you want to develop in your life, those things don't matter, and you should not even consider them. When you wake up in the morning, like, okay, what kind of reputation am I going to have today? You shouldn't be thinking, well, I wonder if people are going to like me. Who cares? Really, who cares? You really have to have that mindset. I really, I don't care what people say about how I treat my wife. So long as I'm married and she's loving me, I really give, I don't give a rip what anyone says. I'm still married, and guess what? One day, I'm, I'm going to be old and married, and that's it, unless the Lord comes. I don't care what everyone says. I have a good relationship. So I, I could just put the, the desire to be popular, put the desire to be liked by everyone, I could put that aside, and just worry about developing the good reputation. So let me tell you what the good reputation is. Uh, a good reputation is letting your yes be yes, and your no, no. In other words, you as a Christian, if you want to develop the type of good reputation God's talking about, you need to be a man or a woman of your word. You tell somebody you're going to do something, you do it. Uh, nothing drives me nuts as much as I hear 
a Christian say, I'm going to help you with something, and then when time comes for them to actually help, it's like, where'd you go? Where, what happened? Why aren't you here? You said you would be here, and we were depending upon you being here. And you, I'm sure, have experienced that, where some Christian gave you their word, I'll be there for you. And the second you needed them, they were out. That's not a good reputation. That's not what you and I as believers should have. And then also, not only our yes, yes, but our no, no. And that's important too. When you say, hey, listen, I'm not going to do that, or I won't partake in that, or this is not something I'm going to be doing, and you say no, and then next thing you know, you find you doing that or being a part of something you said no to, You've ruined that reputation. We need to be men and women of our word. Does it make sense? That this is, this is what God's looking after. When we're talking about good reputation, we're supposed to be men and women of our word. We're supposed to be humble, not walking around full of pride. We're supposed to be a good steward of the resources God has given us. You and I are to raise up godly children if God gives you the privilege of being a parent here on earth. You raise up men and women of God who love the Lord and are going to live separated from this world. You work hard because God doesn't want lazy people. He wants people that are hard workers. And I'm telling you, I mean, I, I was thinking about how cool it is. We've got people that I know, I know men and women who their jobs are seasonal or they just they find themselves out of work for one reason or another. And you know where they are? They're here at the church working doing stuff, waiting until their job starts back up again or whatever, but they don't want to be idle. They don't want to be lazy, and so they're working hard. That's what God's after, is somebody who would step up and be a hard worker. If you are a husband, God expects you, if you're going to have a good reputation, He expects you to be faithful to your wife. If you're a woman, He expects you to speak well of your husband. Husbands, He he talks to us about this in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, listen to this. You are supposed to Love your wives. Now, I I know that might just sound so general and so, oh my gosh, we've heard that so often. I'm supposed to love my wife. No, you, man, listen, you are supposed to take yourself off. Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for a friend. The whole idea of laying down your life means your wants, your wishes, your needs, your desires. Listen, men, you take them off and you lay them down as though they don't matter anymore and you put your wife on her wants her wishes her needs her desires that's the type of love god's talking about here you love your wives just as christ loved the church you think christ wanted to go to the cross no he had you in mind and he had me in mind he put our wants our wishes our needs our desires on in that moment he didn't want to do that he went Submitting to God. He gave up his life to, for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Men, this is what God has called you to do if you are a husband. You are to love your wife. That's the type of reputation you are to have. When people look at your life as a husband and they see what you do, they're going to look at how you treat your wife. And listen, ladies, it's not just the men, okay? I picked on the men. I'm going to pick on the the women for just a moment. And all the men are like, yeah, come on, tell her. All right, no, listen, it's serious. God's Word talks about both sides. Proverbs 31. How many of you ladies have heard of Proverbs 31? Proverbs 31, woman. If you haven't, I want to recommend, go read Proverbs 31, and it lists out for you the characteristics of the virtuous wife, the strong wife. Men, you're going to be so happy that I told your wives to go read this. Listen, part of what it says is her husband, this virtuous wife, this good woman, her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with the other civic leaders. In other words, he has a good reputation because his wife has spoken so well of him. His wife is always lifting him up, building him up. And so when he stands at the city gate with, his, with the other people, they're like, oh, there's that man. Oh, you and his wife were saying this and this. Oh, yeah, he's a good man. You know, that's what you're supposed to be doing as a woman. I can tell you, my wife's so good at that. Because sometimes I hear her, I'm like, don't you even know me? Like, why, you know, she's like, oh, you're great. Like, really? And she's, she really believes these things. She's telling these 
people these things about me. And I'm like, it's kind of embarrassing. That's not even true, you know. Um, my wife loves to talk good about me. It develops a good reputation. We should have good reputations. But listen, we can't do this on our own. When my wife talks good about me, like I said, I'm, I'm thinking like when she says certain things, I'm like, there's, this is just not the case. She goes, no, I see that in you. And what she's seeing is God at work in me. That's what she's seeing. When she sees anything good, she's seeing God at work. Because listen, if you've known me for any stretch of time, my brother's sitting here right now. He's known me for my whole life. He knows I'm a piece of work. And now he's mad at me for even bringing him up. But the thing is, he knows. I, if you've known me for any, any length of time, you know I'm, I'm just, I'm a screw up. I really am. I'm a, mess, I'm a messed up person. I just serve a really perfect God. And so when my wife speaks well about me, it's just because she's seen God at work in me. So my point in telling you that is you have to rely on God for this good reputation. You're not going to develop this on your own. Husbands, you can't love your wife the way God's called you to love your wife without God. You can't do it. And ladies, you can't speak well about your husband without God. The, you know, you can say certain things, but you can't just, just do this the way God has called you to do this, just always building him up like that. You're going to find yourself frustrated with him, and you're going to want to go out to lunch with your lady friends and tell them what a jerk he is. And, you know, and that, the thing is, that's just not what a godly woman does. So you need to rely on God to develop this good reputation. So if you're a note taker, I'm going to give you three things that you need to know about relying on God for this good reputation. You guys ready? Yes. All right. So we're going to be, again, first, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. If you haven't made your way, go ahead and make your way there. The first thing is this. We're going to rely on God for a good reputation that you and I would be full of grace and truth. And the reason we need to rely on Him to be full of grace and truth is because Jesus himself was full of grace and truth. And if he was full of grace and truth and he is in us, then we can now have that same thing. Jesus had that reputation. I mean, look at this verse. Jesus, there it is. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says this about Jesus. First of all, we know Jesus is the Word, right? So the Word became flesh. We're talking about Jesus being born here on earth, putting on flesh. Jesus dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Verse 8 of our text this morning says, that in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may have heard that verse just now and thought, I don't hear grace in that statement. Flaming fire, taking vengeance on people who don't obey God, that doesn't sound very gracious to me. Now, let me just unpack that for a moment so we understand what we're talking about. So last week, we talked about vengeance. Vengeance isn't ours. Uh, we're not supposed to take out vengeance. If somebody's wronged us, we rely on God. God does that. First of all, he's better at it than we are. If you missed last week and you're dealing with this struggle where you feel somebody's wronged you and you want to get them back, go watch last week's message. Um, God will take care of it. And right here is what we're talking about. There are people that disobey God. They've put God to the side. They don't want to please God at all. And God is going to deal with them with flaming fire. It's not going to be pretty. That's the truth. And Jesus is full of truth, and yet there's the grace of God because not everybody's going through that. And it's not because there's people on this earth that have just lived a perfect life and totally honored God, and so now they, they don't have to go through that. If you are here today and you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have that grace of God. You don't have to go through that, and it's not, and you know this, it's not because you're perfect. It's only because of the grace of God. That's it. Jesus himself is full of that grace and that truth. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about this flaming fire. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, there's the grace right there, we receive the kingdom, which cannot be shaken, let us have grace. We've received grace, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. We need to serve God with a reverence, with a godly fear. 
The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. What does that mean? That the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of God. If somebody doesn't fear God, they really don't know him. Because if you know God, you know he's a consuming fire. What does that mean? It means that sin, our shortcomings, failures, things that go against God, that can't even be in his presence. It would just be consumed up with fire. It, it just God is too pure, too holy to have sin in his presence. And so it's, he's a consuming fire. We know this about God, and so we have a reverent fear, and yet by his grace, we've been allowed to serve him. This is what this verse says, by which we, must, we may serve God acceptably. Listen, he saved us through his son, Jesus Christ. You and I deserve to go to hell and yet we receive a kingdom. That's the grace of God. And that's what we get through Jesus Christ. That is the grace. So he's full of that grace. But then there's the truth. We really deserve death. So in, in the same instant, we deserve death and yet we inherit a kingdom. Simultaneously, both things. And Jesus is simultaneously full of grace that we get heaven even though we haven't earned it or deserve it. He's full of that, but at the same time, he's full of truth. You can see this all throughout the life of Jesus. And you watch his ministry here on earth, and he would go and he would see people like the woman caught in adultery. Now, did she commit adultery? Yeah, she was caught in it, right? She was caught in the very act. She did that. Did Jesus tell her, well, it's okay that you did that. It's okay. Go ahead and do that again. You know, you enjoyed it. You were having fun, so you might as well just keep doing that. No. I mean, he showed her grace, and at the same time, he said, don't do that anymore. Stop sinning. I'm going to show you grace, but I'm going to tell you the truth. See, in the church world, what you'll find is people will, will try, kind of lean one way or the another. They'll, and most of the church world leans heavily on the grace side of it. Oh, you know, let's just be full of grace full of grace. Oh, you know, we got to just be so gracious to people because, you know, I've received the grace from God. I want to extend the grace to other people. So let's just be full of grace. And they put the truth aside and nobody wants to address the truth. They don't want to acknowledge the truth. They don't want to know the truth. That stuff is kind of offensive. We'll put that aside and we'll just be gracious to everyone, accept everyone and everything and everything will be okay. I say that because it truly is what's going on in the church world. They're falling so far onto this side. There is the grace of God, and it is important. But there's the truth. Now, there's other people that, that they've put the grace aside, and they're all about the truth. You did this, that's wrong. This, the consequence for that is death, which means hell. You know, you're going to hell, and it's all about the truth, and they forget the grace part. See, somewhere we as Christians need to develop a reputation where we have this balance like Jesus had, where simultaneously we're full of grace and full of truth. But again, we can only do that if we have the, the Holy Spirit within us. If we have the Spirit of God there, now we can rely on Him to know how to balance these things out. There's a big problem right now in the church not having that balance. Um, what you're finding is people don't want to tell people the truth. And that's the reputation the church has developed. And now it's, it's like, well, if you are telling the truth, then somehow you're a radical because, you know, you told me that this lifestyle is wrong or that's, you shouldn't be doing that. So, oh my gosh, that's so offensive. Those, those aren't really true Christians because they're offending you. And let me tell you something. The Bible itself and I, I say this every week when you guys come in here. Um, it's inerrant. It's infallible. We believe in it. We trust it. And you guys, most of you keep coming back. So I'm assuming you agree with me, which is awesome. Um, now here's the deal. This Bible that is inerrant and infallible, what it says about itself is that it is offensive. It does. It says it's offensive it says that it cuts like a knife down to the bone and marrow. It actually divides a person from spirit and soul. It gets down to the very core of who we are, and that's uncomfortable, and it's offensive. 
It really truly is. Think about it. When somebody tells you that what you're doing is wrong, what's your natural reaction? To be offended. Like, oh my gosh, they told me that my lifestyle is bad. Oh, you know, and you feel like somehow you've been wronged. And if you ask my kids, I'll tell you, my kids can tell you what happens when you get offended. You guys know what happens when you get offended, right? Nothing. Nothing happens. You know, we're so afraid of offending people, but the fact is nothing happens. I don't know why we bought into this, that somehow as Christians we can't tell people the truth. If we're not telling people the truth, who's going to? It's the very reason we're still alive. It's the reason there's still breath in our air. If, you, if, if, there's, if there's breath in your lungs and you are a Christian, you have given your life over to Jesus, there's only breath in your lungs because God wants to use you as a tool to share the truth with people. He doesn't have you here still to develop a good bank account. He doesn't have you here still to get a great retirement and enjoy the rest of it. Now, those things are good. Don't get me wrong. It's fun to enjoy life. I love enjoying life. But if along life we aren't sharing the truth with people, then what are we doing? What kind of reputation do we have? Are we known as people that are going to tell the truth? I'll tell you what. I, I, would, I love people know this about me. I'll tell you the truth. I will, and it's going to hurt. But guess what? I've got that reputation because I keep doing it. And that's okay. I, don't, I really don't care. The fact is, there's people that don't like it. There really are. I mean, we've got an entire, the Marietta Teachers Association does not like it. <laughs> they don't. They refer to me as the religious freak. They don't like me. Um, I'm trying to force religion on the school. I mean, they, they're ridiculous. They don't like me one bit. I am not popular with them. But I'll tell you what, I've got, I've got a good reputation because I tell the truth. You know, this is important for us as we develop our reputation as Christians, that we will, we will be known how, how, that we can share truth with people, but at the same time, share grace. The truth, I mean, I, I love this. You can share this with anybody, and it is offensive, but look at, you know, situations that are all over the place. Divorce. I mean, I'm not going to ask for a hand raised, but let's face it, a lot of people have been divorced. Is divorce good? No. Is divorce okay with God? No, it's not. Let's face it. We can tell the truth about this. Now, can God still work with somebody that's been divorced? Absolutely. Can God forgive that? Absolutely. Can God still bless somebody after that? Absolutely. This is the grace of God that he would bless you and use you and have you be a testimony to other people even though you've sinned. Is abortion wrong? Absolutely. Can God still take a woman who's had an abortion even though it's a, a sin and it's awful and terrible and should never be done, can he take that woman and use her as a blessing to people? Absolutely. This is the truth of God. It's not good, but he'll still love you and love through you and do incredible things in your life, grace and truth. And there's nothing wrong with telling people these truths. In fact, it's exactly what we should be doing. It's the reputation we should have. They should know, hey, when I come to you, are you going to love me and tell me the truth? Are you going to love me enough to tell me the truth and not look down on me because I haven't done right in your, in your eyes or a community's eyes? You know, I've had people like, oh, I can't go to the church because, you know, they know what I've done. <laughs> We've probably done the same thing. Come on in. We are imperfect people serving a perfect God. It's that simple. But we should have that reputation. We're going to tell people the truth, even though the truth is offensive, the truth hurts, it really does. The truth is offensive. We don't need to shy away from that. God, God already said it's going to be offensive. People aren't going to like you. You're not going to be popular. But you can be unpopular with a very good reputation. And that's good. Second thing is this. We rely on God for a good reputation that we would seek our acceptance and attention from Him. And let's face it, we all want we all want you know, to feel accepted. We all want attention. Um, well, let me just read the verses here. Nine, look at verse 9. It says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes, verse 10, in that day, uh, capital D there for day, we're talking about the day of the Lord, to be glorified in His saints. Who's His saints? How many of you are believers of Jesus Christ? You've given your life over to Him. You are the saints. So to be glorified in you. 
and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. There's going to come a point in time, this is what we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, we saw in chapter 4, last book, that there's going to point in time where God's going to raise the dead. Whoever's died in Christ, they were a Christian and they died, God's going to raise their body, right? And their body will be reconstituted and transformed. If you are alive when that happens, your body will be transformed. So, you know, first the dead will raise, then all our bodies are going to be transformed, and we're going to be caught up in heaven. It's called the rapture. God's already told us about this. Now, the cool thing is, what he says is, in that time, he's going to come back to the earth with us. So we go up to heaven, we're in the clouds, we're going to be with the Lord forever. He's going to come back, and he's going to be admired by everyone. And so are you, because you have his spirit in you. It's what this, this, what this says right here. Glorified in his saints, in you. You will be fully accepted, and you will be fully, people are going to be totally paying attention to you. They're going to look at you like, oh my gosh, look at the Lord in you. Whoa, I mean, they're just going to see this glorious presence of God. And it's kind of cool because it, you don't have to wait until then to start to experience that. Like I said earlier, when my wife, she's speaking so highly of me, it's not because of me. She sees God at work in me. There's something very attractive about that. When God is in somebody and he's working in somebody, people see it. They're like, look at what God's doing. That's incredible. And you, you'll feel that acceptance because God's doing that work in you. And you know that if God's doing it, then he's accepted you as his child. Now, here's what happens, and here's where we as believers err. We are fully accepted by God, and we can have our attention because of God in us, and yet we still try to get acceptance in the world. And we still seek out attention here on earth. And you might say, well, not me, pastor. Not me. No way. I beg to differ. We all do it. When you wake up in the morning and you stand in front of the mirror, ladies, and some of you guys, not me, because I'm talking about doing your hair, you stand and, and, you know, the makeup men, sorry, none of you should be doing this, okay? I know it's 2019, but I draw the line. Men, we don't wear makeup. So when you stand in front of the mirror, though, and you're doing your hair, are you doing that because you don't give a rip what anyone thinks about how you look? No. No, you stand in front of the mirror, you do your hair because you want to look good because you want to feel accepted. You want some attention that you look nice. We do this. This is humanity. We do it. Anybody who says they don't do it, they're lying. You, you put on certain clothes. You don't, you don't just throw on camel's hair like uh, John the Baptist, Right? I mean, we all have a style. Everybody's got a style that they try for. You try for it. Some try harder than others. They do. Let's face it. Some people are really, really into their style. Um, but we all do. We go shopping at specific places because there's our style. There's what we wear. You know, Everybody's got it. And we're trying to be accepted. We're trying to fit in. We're trying to, to feel like we're valued in some way. That's humanity. And I'm not saying these things are wrong. What I'm saying is when that becomes our focus, when we're trying to gain our acceptance because somehow our hair now is the right style or our clothes are the right clothes or we're driving the right car or our house is in the right zip code or whatever it is, when we're trying to feel accepted because of those things, we're going to find, very, very, we're going to find ourselves very, very miserable. Because, first of all, those things, they change. You know, with the exception of a few of us that have just gone bald, here's the deal. Hairstyles change. I'm kind of like, I've, I've kind of thrown my hat over the fence with the whole bald thing. It's been like almost two decades now. I'm not growing my hair. There's hardly any of it to grow more, anymore anyways. So I'm kind of done with that. 
But for those of you who still have hair, you know this, hairstyles change. You see Brittany on our worship team. She comes in here. She's got a different color like every month. You know, there's some, something going on. And it's cool. She expresses herself. It's who she is. I love Brittany. She's amazing. And that's cool. It's fun. It's who she is. And let's face it. First of all, the Bible says that the glory of a woman is her hair. That's what the Bible says. It attracts people to the woman. So that's women do their hair up because that's what the Bible says. They just don't know it. They don't know they're fulfilling what the Bible says. But we, we do this. We try to gain it, and it's, it's never going to really end because it's so changing. Hairstyles change. Clothes styles change. Car styles change. You know, if somebody said back in 1984, you got the new 1984 Honda Civic. Oh, man, that's so cool. Who wants a 1984 Honda Civic now? <laughs> One person. See? Not that many. <laughs> this, my, my point is things change. And unless you, you know, unless you completely disassociate from society altogether, here on earth, there's still going to be some level of that where you're, you're gaining acceptance or you're feeling, feeling like, like people are giving you the attention that you feel like you deserve. You're still going to be kind of stuck in this place where you're, you're trying to get that from the world. And God says, no, I, I really don't want you to get it from the world. I want you to feel totally accepted by me. And, and it's true. When you find yourself seeking the approval of God, when you find yourself seeking attention from Him, that will never fail you. That will never leave you disappointed because God is always there. He's always paying attention to you. He's always crazy about you. He loves you so much. He sent his only son to die for you. I mean, you are so important to him. He's, like I said, he's crazy about you. He thinks about you more than you think about yourself. He thinks about you every second of every hour of every day of every year. I mean, he's always considering you. You are the, of the utmost importance to him. And yet we find ourselves trying to be accepted by other, other things. God says, look, you're, you're accepted by me. You've got my attention. And God wants us to value that. Colossians chapter 3, it says, if you were raised with Christ, how many of you were raised with Christ? I know I was. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. This is a mindset that we have to have. If we're going to rely on God to have the reputation that we've been accepted by God, that, that we're, we're getting the attention from God that we need. And you can see, what I'm, what I'm getting at is when, when you look at somebody, you can tell if they desperately need the world's attention. You can tell they're desperately seeking that out or seeking out the attention of, of a man or seeking out the attention of a woman or the approval of, of the world. You can tell when somebody is so focused on that instead of, you know what, I'm accepted by God. You can see it. I mean, like I said, there's going to be some level of trying at some point, but when somebody fully is accepted by God, they can feel it in their life, they'll gain that reputation that their mind is set on things which are above. Why? Because that's where Christ is. That's where our mind, if that's where Christ is, that's where our mind is. If our mind is there, all of this here on earth, it starts to become less valuable to us. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying let yourself go and you don't care and you're not going to do any manscaping anymore and you know, you're just going to be all, all natural. <laughs> People do what you're going to do, you know, but what I'm saying is that can't be the focus. Our mind's got to be in heaven, right? Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also appear, will appear with him in glory. There's going to come a point in time where he's going to come back to this earth. When he comes back to this earth, you're going to be with him. People are going to see him in you. They're going to, I'm telling you, they're going to be amazed. But we can have that now. Not in, in the totality of what we're talking about there, but it starts now. You can gain that reputation now as you set your mind on the things above and fill your acceptance in Christ and get all your attention from Him. You're going to feel so accepted and people are going to see it in your life. You'll develop that reputation. You know, there are, let's just face it, there are some people that fly the banner of Christianity 
They're not seeking the Lord's acceptance or attention at all. They're totally sold out to the world. All they care about is getting acceptance from the world. All they care about is getting attention. And you can see it. They've got that reputation. Oh, they're that, that person that she says she's a Christian or he says he's a Christian. They don't have the reputation that, that they're fully accepted by God. So we need to develop that in our life, but we have to rely on God for it. Third thing is this. We need to rely on him for a good reputation that we would find our worth in him. There's a difference between getting acceptance and, and getting attention from God. It's different when we find our worth in him. It's like We all want to feel valued, and we all feel valuable, like we matter, right? Um, we find our worth in all sorts of things. I want to show you a picture of a family. You guys know this family well. Um, when you look at that family, I could tell you this, with the exception of Donald Trump, all the rest of them aren't Donald Trump, Right? But they're, they're either married to Donald Trump, they're a child of Donald Trump, they're a grandchild of Donald Trump. They have the Trump name, and I guarantee you, if they were to walk into Trump Tower and ask for a meal, nobody would deny them service. Because they know I'm part of the Trump family. And nobody would ever get upset with them because they acted out or something and say, hey, we've got the right to refuse service to anybody, so you need to get out. They would never do that. Why? Because these people are valued by Donald Trump. He, he puts great value. You can tell how he acts with his family. He's a man who loves his family. He puts great value on his sons, his daughters, his grandchildren. He puts great value on them. And so because of that, they feel that value. They know they're valued. And they can walk into any establishment that's owned by Trump, and they're going to they're gonna walk in there with full confidence that they're going to be treated right. Think about it this way. That, that stuff that Donald Trump has accumulated, buildings and money and whatever he has, it's going to pass away. Now, I've heard Donald Trump has a gold toilet. That's awesome. But when you look at our Father in Heaven, you know, He paves the streets with gold. So really isn't that impressive that He's got a gold toilet. And heaven and earth are going to pass away. But God's kingdom is going to go on forever and ever and ever. You're His child. He values you so much that He sent His only Son to die so that way you could be with Him forever. That's how much He values you. And when you recognize that, you know that he's your father in heaven and that he values you that way, you can live your life in every situation knowing that you're valued. You don't have to seek value out. The reason I'm sharing this with you, well, take a look what it says in verse 11. It says that, you know, this is Paul and his ministry partners talking to the church. He says, we pray for you always that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, you can be glorified in God, in Christ, because of what Christ did for you. You're valued. You're valued so much that he died. I mean, think about that. That's how much you're valued. You know, we're, we're 412 church here in Marietta, Acts 412. It tells us that there is no salvation. You can't have eternal life in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you and I can be saved. God values you so much that he's given the righteousness of Christ to you that you would be covered by that and have life eternal. We have, when we look at our own life, we have great value. You can tell the reputation of some people when they're trying to feel valued in other places where it's a relationship. Oh, you know, if, if I could just get in a relationship with this person, you know, look at them, and then I would feel so valued. And then they get in that relationship, and then the relationship breaks off. And then like, that's it. Nobody loves me. Oh, life is horrible, and I'm never going to be looked up to again. And oh, man, nobody wants me, and I'm just worthless. 
you can see people that have that reputation. You can see it written all over them. You can see it by the things that they do. But for you and for me, that is not the reputation he wants us to have. He wants us to go through life knowing we're valued and not trying to seek it out from other places. I've seen young girls, and it's weird because it's getting more and more as time goes by. God bless you, Nikki. Uh, More and more as time goes by, I'm seeing this. That girls, they're, let's face it, men aren't being the men they're supposed to be. They're not loving their daughters the way they're supposed to love their daughters. And so the daughter's not feeling valued. And she wants to feel valued. And so she's willing to give up her virginity to feel that value. And inevitably, what happens is that boy didn't value her in the first place. And so now he's moved on to another person. But she's already given that up. And now that feeling of worth that she had for that time is gone. And so she's going to go to another person to give that to another person to feel valued. And there's this spiral that goes down and down and down until the person, this young girl, feels so worthless. And it's not until she comes to the Lord Jesus and knows everything that he did for her where she finally finds where her true value is. Her true value is in Jesus and he was there all along and always loved her. And she didn't need, she didn't even need her father for that. I mean, that's what the father's there to show the love. I mean, every relationship you and I have here on earth is to show us about God. I mean, we all get friendships. We have friendships to understand him as a friend. If you're a father, we're, we're blessed as fathers to be a father, to know him as father. If you're married, you're blessed to have a marriage to know that we are the bride of Christ. He is our groom. Every relationship we have is to understand him better. But the thing is, those relationships aren't what show us our value. It's God's, it's what he did through Jesus that shows us our value. When you and I will fully accept that and rely on him for that value, people will see it in our lives. They're going to see it. They'll see how you and I behave. Our reputation will be a good reputation because we're not seeking out the value. And I'm telling you, people can see. I'm, I'm telling you these things you know. You, you've either done these things yourself or you can see it in the life of other people where they're trying to find their value in other things. First of all, if you say you haven't sought out value in other things, you're just fooling yourself, right? We've all done it. And maybe some of us are still doing it, but that doesn't mean it continues on. Just We might even have a certain reputation now, but that reputation can change. It can change. It's about choosing the good reputation. And so as we close this morning, let me just bring you back to the the verse we started with, Proverbs chapter 22. Choose. Choose a good reputation over great riches. Look, we all work. We all strive to do well. And that's important, but that's not where our value is. That's not where our attention is. We need to wake up every morning and choose to have a good reputation, choose to find our acceptance in Him, choose to get our attention from Him, choose to see our value in Him, choose that you and I would live a life that's full of grace and truth. It's a choice that you and I have to do every single day when we wake up. We can... We can strive hard to get, it, get these things from other places, but they're going to fail us. When you and I choose the reputation of a godly person, I'm telling you, first of all, you rely on God for, for that. You ask him for that. He's going to give it to you. He will. He's not, you, you say, Lord, would you just show me that I'm valued by you? I just want to have that reputation that I'm valued. He's not going to go, no. You coming to me for that? No, of course not. He's a loving father. He's never going to do that to you. He'll never do that to me. When we wake up and we choose the godly reputation, he's going to give it to us. And so let's pray right now that you and I would wake up every day and choose that good reputation. Father in heaven. Well, hey, I hope that message you just heard was a blessing to you. It was a challenge to you. It was encouragement to you. Most of all, I hope that if you are a person who has not given your life 
to Jesus that this message just encourages you to do just that. It's very simple to do. All you have to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can say this prayer with me right now. Father in heaven, I confess to you today that I am a sinner Uh, Lord, that I have messed up in life. I haven't lived up to your very high standard, nor can I. And so I'm grateful for what I understand today. I understand that you sent your son, Jesus, to walk here on this earth, to live a life of perfection, to die a death on a cross, to go into the grave, but not just to stay there. He came out, he rose again, and I believe that today. I believe he sent his Holy Spirit. Lord, that as I believe in you today, your Holy Spirit will come upon me that you will take up residence within me, that you will give me the strength, you will give me the wisdom, you will give me the courage, you will give me the boldness, the faith, everything I need to live for you. And so I promise this day forward that my life will be a life spent trying to please you. I pray, Lord, that as I mess up, and I know I will, I pray that your grace and your mercy would be upon me and that you would give me the encouragement to move forward. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you just said that prayer, first of all, I want to welcome you to the family of God. I want you to know that angels in heaven are rejoicing, and we here at 412 Marietta want to rejoice with you. And the next thing you got to know is there's a step that goes beyond giving your life over to Jesus, that is the step called discipleship. And what this is, is the process that you begin to grow in this newfound faith of yours. And we don't want to leave you alone to do that by yourself. God has given his Holy Spirit to you to help you in that, and he brings other people around you. And so we here at 412 Marietta want to help you in that process. So come on out to the church. We'd love to give you the encouragement, give you the tools that you need in this newfound faith. And uh, we'd love to help you grow in your walk. And so come on out on Sundays, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And if you do, come on out and say hello to me. I'd love to get to meet you and encourage you in your faith. God bless you. I love you.